the metrics need to be simple mm -hmm. and they need to align with the mission. And they need to make sense. You should be able to mathematically and very analytically back into those metrics. This was not my uh, vocation by choice. I actually uh, started in sales to make money to go back and get my doctorate in engineering. And then uh, I met a girl and like, oh, well, that was the beginning and the end. And I enjoyed uh, making money in sales and spending money on my, what was my girlfriend, who's now my wife. Oh, um, so I enjoyed that much more than I did uh, trying to go back and get my doctorate. So that's kind of how I started in it. Um, I started EMC. EMC, I went to Splunk um, for a few years. And then I was a few years at uh, Cloudbees. And then uh, from Cloudbees, I went to Instana. And then Instana was acquired by IBM. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. I love that, that this story with what was a girl turned out to be your wife. That's a story and a half yes. <laughs> in sales. I love that so much. And they, they say that every, the downfall of every, every man is a woman. And I would say the opposite. And I would say the fact that my, my success, if you want to view it as that, is because of my wife. So um, we're definitely a good team. So we've definitely been very lucky in that regard. That's really, really nice to hear. I feel like not a lot of people, especially not people in your position, um, speak a lot about their families, their wives and stuff like that, which is actually yeah. really, really refreshing to see. So that's great. Um, yeah. Okay, now we've said that we talk about uh, revenue teams and how to drive good relationships in them. So let's start off there. Um, so essentially what we found is sales and revenue operations is a very human sport at the top level. So what would you say are the most fundamental ways of driving communication between revenue teams within an organization? Um, when you say revenue teams, do you mean like the sales operations team or do you mean different teams geographically located? Uh, it can be both, to be honest, anything, sales, marketing, revenue operations, sales operations, anything that's revenue based, essentially. How do you drive communication? It's yeah. just so I'm clear. Yes. Okay. Um, well, I don't think, you, number one, I would say you shouldn't have to drive communication, right? Mm -hmm. um, communication should be influenced and not so much enforced, but as much as it is influenced, right? And I feel as though that it would be influenced via the way it's influenced is by having a common mission, right? So a lot of it is aligning on what is your mission. And if you have the right mission um, and you're aligned on the right mission, then the conversations naturally start to come because it's then how do you align together to work towards that common goal? For instance, let's say there's a marketing team versus a sales team. Right. Um, in many cases, marketing and sales, you know, there's lots of complaints. I don't have enough MQLs. <laughs> We're generating MQLs. Right? So yeah. the, the difference is, okay, how if our goal is, you know, X million dollars in revenue or X billion dollars in revenue, great. Where are we today from that? And what are the incremental steps that we feel like we need to get there? And then it becomes accountability, right? There's accountability on the sales team to the marketing team and the marketing team on the sales team. There's a great book by Jocko Willenick called Extreme Ownership. And in it, he, he discusses the concept of cover and move. And um, what that means is kind of working together as a team. So, you know, you're covering for the other team while they're moving. And then, then once they get to where they're covered, then you move and then they cover you. And that's a lot of, you know, what, you, what needs to be reinforced, right? Um, cadence is one thing, but accountability within those cadence calls is another thing. And the accountability is really driven by what is the common mission, right? Um, a lot of times what happens, what I see in organizational structures is, is the teams aren't at different levels of understanding, right? So the, the sales team doesn't fully understand what the MQL process looks. I'm just using this, this analog, right? Mm -hmm. But the sales team doesn't fully understand what the MQL process is or what those, the key drivers are to, to the MQLs. Right. And then the marketing team doesn't necessarily understand what's happening and the fidelity of those MQLs, what the impact is to the sales team. So because of it, you have it takes some time and you have to get everybody on the same playing field so they understand the same parameters and they're talking the same language. Right. And obviously, you know, when you're talking internationally, sometimes that becomes a challenge. 
but but also just language the same language within within the, the revenue generating teams does that make sense yeah it makes perfect sense yeah like maintaining that same the communication should come naturally if you've got the same end goal and if you're working towards the same thing but another thing that I was going to ask you is what whilst you were saying that is for them to understand that language for them to speak the same language what goes into that apart from time and graft would you say from a leadership point of view what else do you need to fuel into it um I think um understanding understanding what the other what the other team is doing so what's in other words like what's a day in the life of a sales rep right. um number one number two understanding how the sales reps are measured right i know that's one of the it's the second question is the kpi question so i'm sure we'll cross that bridge when we get to it right but if i measure my sales reps on you know uh 10 meetings a week one net new opportunity per week on a rolling three-week average the marketing team needs to understand that because a lot of the pressure that they're feeling to meet those meeting those meeting requirements and those KPIs, that's being driven from that, right? Yeah. So the other part of it is understanding the day in the life of how how are things working, um, you know, for the sales team and then vice versa for the marketing team, right? So what tools, what technologies are you using? Are you using, you know, Albacross? Are you using HubSpot? Are you using, you know, so what does that process look like? We had an interesting, or I, I had an interesting, um, uh, interesting situation happen where we were talking through, we were looking at the data together jointly. We we're looking at the KPIs together, you know, in in formation to our mission. And as we're looking at the data, um, it came down to a breakdown in communication, and and the communication was on the process. The marketing team was saying, well, all these leads haven't been dispositioned. Um, you know, and they're old, they're like three years old. The sales team is saying, I just talked to that person yesterday, or I talked to that account yesterday. Mm -hmm. So the sales team wasn't updating the dispositioning, but additionally, marketing is looking at it going, some of these names are two years old and the, the sales team is going, yeah, they're two years old. Why am I going to want to talk to them? But what the marketing team wasn't telling the sales team was that, yeah, the lead is two years old, but they've been, act they've had activity in the last week. So some of it is communication and then alignment on the process and understanding what the day in the life looks like because in the reps framework, they're going into the, that customer contacting portal or, or um, whatever you want to call it, that software. And they're looking at it and they're doing exactly what they should be doing, but they're hearing from marketing that, well, you're not dispositioning these leads. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, so it's, it's, it's not just, telling them what it's like, it's sitting down and looking at the same data set and saying, okay, is this in line with what our mission is, right? Now that's just a, that's a cross-functional example. Yeah. You know, when you're talking about revenue teams, like in a geo, mm -hmm. um, the best way to drive in, to drive communication and drive consistency is through shared best practices, right? That's one of the best things. So win stories, this is what I did. Right. Um, the other part of it, and we haven't been able to do this because of COVID, but is to get people together in the same room. You know, yeah. my 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 grandmother used to tell me the reason why she always used to hug me was because because you can't get mad at somebody when you're hugging them. Oh, right? so, <laughs> isn't that funny? And I never really. And then it's funny. I was reading an article about about you know about raising your kids and and uh, and just about talking with people. And it said when you're really really angry with somebody, grab onto them right? Because it's really hard to remain angry. In most cases, you're angry and it's only a temporary thing. The next day you'll, you'll you know, so, so it's that concept is still there by getting the teams together. There's something to be said for being in, in physical, the physical presence of one another. So I think we've been working without that, right? For a long time. I think it's taught us some good things, right? So there's, there's good that comes from that. And the good that comes from that is you really have to be really good at communication, right? So shared best practices, shared communication, win stories. This is what I did. You know, this is where I've been successful. That's along revenue teams. That also helps you to drive consistency. And then at a leadership level, you need to reinforce the behavior that you want driven, right? And you reinforce it through positive reinforcement, through making sure that your leadership team below you is reinforcing the same things that you want reinforced, but that means you, everyone has to be clear on communication, clear on the objectives and clear on the mission. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. Of course it does. Yeah. I, that, um, 
thing that you just said about your grandmother that actually touched me as well um because I think that is so true and that's a great way to get your teams to understand each other better so yeah great answer actually that's a, a very warm sunny sunshine kind of answer that's the only way that I can describe that that answer was like a warm hug um well, we're, we're human right I mean yeah. we're human and the, the reason why people sell software, at least I sell software, but the reason why people sell software is, you know, is because of connection, if you can make a connection, right? So that ability to make a connection with people is really, really critical. And I think, you know, you know, it's, you know, uh, Daniel Pink wrote a book um, to sell his human. And in that book, he states, um, you know, the, the paradigm has shift, has shifted, right? In sales, it's no longer buyer beware, it's now seller beware. So because of people are getting so much data and they're able to do so much more research in advance of engaging like we are right now, one-on-one, -on -one, there's a little bit of a, there, that, there's not that barrier, there's not that push to reinforce the connection. But so when you can find somebody that you can connect with and the person knows their product really well and they understand and they're really a good listener and they're a good question asker, if you will, or they're good at helping you to find the problem, um, it connects, right? It's resonance that you, when you can resonate with somebody, because you're always going to buy soft, more software from somebody that you <laughs> love than not from somebody that you don't like, you know? So, but I don't want to get too, too philosophical, on that, but I think you get the point. Yeah, of course. I don't think that's philosophical at all. I think that's exactly what you just said. It's human. Something that yeah. uh, a great leader that I interviewed has told me once is people trust people and we want to trust people. So if you can be that person, then you're, you're there. You're there. There's nothing else that's going to hinder you. And that's always stuck with me. And every time I think about doing anything in my life, I'm human and I'm trying to connect with another human. So that's, that's what's the, great. What's, what's the best way to build trust, do you just, think? I think it's talking, just really, really? communicating. And being authentic right? Being yourself, right? And being authentic, right? When people are authentic and you realize that that person, your barrier, you don't feel like you need to play defense, right? You yeah. can be more open because that person's being more authentic with you and they're not afraid of that. But the reason why people aren't authentic is they don't feel good that they, they don't feel like they can, yeah. right? And they don't feel like they can because they haven't been encouraged to do so, right? So, but that's the part, right? With, it takes 10,000 hours to, to develop mastery in anything, right? So, a lot, not a lot of salespeople have 10,000 hours. Right? So <laughs> you have to, uh, it takes time to do that. 100%, especially not at the end of every quarter. I think that's especially when salespeople don't have 10,000 <laughs> hours. But what we were saying is we were going to get into metrics. So going yeah. based on what you just said, and you know, you look at your salespeople and you look at your team in a very like can they ask great questions can they be great communicators is that one of the metrics that you use to define your revenue function and what are other metrics that you use as well yeah no i it's that's that's a hard metric because to, to define right asking questions and being you can't really identify that i think you know the metrics at the end of the day this is still it's still a job right and this is still a numbers game Right, so the better that you are, and the more successful, the more that you make you utilize repeatable processes that are successful, the better your chances are. It's about chances of success, is really what it is. So, with that being said, um, the metrics that that I look at are are different, but the metrics need to be very so. This is my guidelines, right? For my guys, is is the metrics need to be simple, mm -hmm. and they need to align with the mission, right? So, if our mission and they need to make sense. You should be able to mathematically and very analytically back into those metrics. So let's say my goal is to drive, I don't know, uh, I'll just make it simple, $50,000, $50,000, 50 million in revenue, right? Okay, well, how many opportunities does that need to be? How many opportunities is that? Let's just say it's, let's just make it super simple math. Let's say it's 5,000, right? So 5,000, right? Time to get to 50 million, right? You multiply that, then you divide that by the number of salespeople that you have. And that's the number of opportunities that you need to close. And then, okay, you say just some just some general practices. Let's say it takes six meetings on it for every opportunity before you close that. And then you back into that. And then you say, okay, look, overall, this is what you need to do 
you know, in order for us to achieve our goal, not only is this good for you, but this goal is good for the company. And when the company's performing and you're performing, everybody's good. Think of it like a, they, those, you ever see those Russian nesting dolls where it's yep. like the little, <laughs> the other. So their goals, their KPIs meet the team's goals. And then the team's goals meet the region's goals. And then the region's goals meet the theater's goal. And the theater's goal meets the company's goal. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. you make you have to be able to draw the connection to if you're executing and doing your job, yeah. Then what happens is that's good success, not just for you, but your success actually drives additional success outside of you know outside of you, right? Yeah. So that's the one. Again, this is very kind of generic. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're looking for specific KPIs for my salespeople, the KPIs are different. Yep. than for my customer success teams, which are different than my technical, my technical guys, right? So the metrics need to be different, but most importantly, they need to be easily understood and super, super simple. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example. Do you want an example? Would that help? Of course. Yeah, of course I want an, an example, example of everything. <laughs> one, one net new meeting, one, sorry, excuse me, one net new opportunity per week, yep. right? Every week, right? So if you think about that, let's say per there's rep. 52 per rep. Right. Yep. Let's say that there's 52 weeks in a year. Mm -hmm. Okay. So average that out. Let's say there's probably 12 viable weeks. So over the course of the year, they should create, you know, about 48 opportunities, right. For the, you know, when you take vacations and stuff like that, yep. about 48 opportunities, you take that and you multiply that times your ASP. That's the pipeline that you'd be building. Plus the pipeline that they've already potentially inherited, or if they don't, then the, from the, exist, the, the existing customer potential revenue that they'd be inheriting. So you make that super simple for them. So now all they're thinking about and all they're reinforcing is I need to create that opportunity. I need to create that opportunity. Right? So that's, that's kind of on the build side, right? Then there's the mature side, right? So, okay, on my, my mature side, I need to move, you know, I've got four deals in the quarter. I need to move those four deals, one sales stage or one sales cycle, you know, over, you know, per every two weeks, mm -hmm. right? So I'm looking at now that's the mature side. And then when you look at the close, I've got four opportunities in quarter. I need to close at least one of those deals, right? So by keeping the metrics super simple across build, mature, and close for a salesperson, Yep. They know those are the three functional areas that you're going to drive of their job and they know what the expectation is, right? And then when you sit down, you have a conversation with them, you say, look, we talked about $50 million, right? We talked about five, we talked about 5,000, right? 5,000 opportunities, right? We talked about the number of opportunities you need to create. And we talked about, you know, when I look at it, we talked about the number of meetings you should have per week. You're behind on the meetings. Guess what? means you're probably not going to have the opportunities, right? So it's very easy for them to walk down it. And then your conversation becomes, where are you struggling? And when you can have that conversation, that's where you start to, and going back to our first topic, that's the connection piece. Let me help you to improve and let me bring resources. And that's where people can start to feel like they are able to develop. And when they feel like they're developing and they feel like they're growing, they're more comfortable with themselves they can be more human. And when somebody's comfortable with themselves, you can feel it. And you, yeah. and you, you, you're kind of attracted to it. Like you want to, you want to, you like that person and, yeah. and you're comfortable spending money with that person. So, you know, it's all about expectation setting in my, in my opinion, and the metrics can be used for, it's like, um, you know, like Spider-Man's um, uncle said to him, right? With great power <laughs> comes great responsibility. The metrics are that way too. It's like, they can be used for good or they can be used for evil. So, you know, what is it that you want to potentially want to do? So that's a very long-winded answer to that question. That's a great answer. You're honestly full of incredible, amazing quotes and stories that I just, I just want to pick your brain all day. Um, what, what you were just saying there is that KPIs can be used as a good thing and a bad thing. Looking at it from an international point of view, you've got teams here, you've got teams there, you've got teams everywhere. Yes, they they keep it very simple, but how do you keep track of everybody and how they do and how they're achieving? Like, you're a busy person. How how do you keep track of that? I I've been lucky to have really really good sales operations people. Um, you know, the analytics that drive a sales machine are exceptionally critical. Right, that's number one. Number two is I've had 
been very lucky to work with really smart people, people that are a lot smarter than me that work for me. So they actually take the concepts and they're like, yeah, okay, this is how I can make it better. Mm -hmm. So part of it is, you know, a lot of it's the team around you. Um, but you have to have the visualizations. You have to be able to see and do the analytics and you have to be able to look at it and you have to, this is the biggest portion with the analytics and the reporting is that you have to know that it's credible and you have to know that it's, it's accurate, right? Because the first time that you start, you start pointing out to somebody they're below their performance from an, when you look at the data, what's the first thing, what's the natural reaction? They're gonna push back on the data. Well, let me tell you why that's not accurate. Okay, good. All right, great. Well, we'll tighten that process. But in general, this is what we're seeing. So, yeah. so you know, in terms of how do you do it across, you know, internationally, internationally, it comes down to having a one comprehensive dashboard, but then it's broken out by the different regions, right? Again, it goes back to the Russian nesting dolls. You have to have individual performance. You have to have team performance, which is in, let's say, a theater, Right. And then in the, the theaters, you have your districts and the districts, you have your regions. Then you have, you know, like, you know, EMEA, you have APAC, that would be a theater. And then you've got in EMEA, you've got different regions. You've got DOC, you've got UK, you've got MIA. Right. So those regions and then you have districts within those regions and then you have your teams in those districts and then you have the individuals. Right. So but it all goes, you should be able to drill, keep drilling down and down and down and down and down mm -hmm. so you can have the metrics because those metrics all build, it's like a pyramid, right? Yeah. The, the, all the metrics built to the very quint the quintessential point, which is ultimately revenue. Yeah. So it's like a, think of it like an analytics pyramid, right? Yeah. Where it's comprised of a lot of different data points, but they should all be connected just like those Russian nesting dolls, right? I love that uh, Russian nesting dolls. I reckon that's going to be the title for this interview is uh, <laughs> Russian nesting dolls with Matthew. I, I <laughs> Just so you know, I, I did move my, I have, a, I can give you about five or 10 more minutes. Yeah. Um, I just, my one-on-one. -on -one, yeah. So if you have another. Amazing. I feel, like, I feel like I've been talking a lot. So I know no. there's probably more questions. Yeah, go for it. I love it. I love it when people give longer answers rather than giving it very short and concise. Cause I want to, I want to see how your brain works. I want to see how you've gotten yeah. to how your brain works like that. So <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how deep you want to go there because it gets, it gets dark and weird fast. So that's okay. We'll ask your that. wife. We'll ask your wife. <laughs> she no. will, she will tell me it's, it's not very deep. There's a lot of holes in there. So Oh, I love it. I love the hose. I love the hose, especially with people that give great analogies. I think that like I myself always make analogies whenever I'm explaining something. So my boyfriend always turns around and he's like, I, mean, I literally have no idea what you're, what you're talking about. But now that you've made that analogy, it kind of makes sense. So I completely feel you on that. Let me just, yeah. another thing that I wanted to ask you is what mistakes have you learned that you could share with the community uh, what what has happened in your career big boo-boos that you would love to discuss with me today honestly, <laughs> there's not enough time to answer that question um, give me top three I, honestly i can go i mean well what are you most interested in so if it's people is it process is it is it you know, uh, customers, like you pick, give me a topic because I could probably have 10 of the on each topic that I could talk through in terms of what I messed up on. So let me just say this in general, mm -hmm. our conception or our concept of, of failure is really, really difficult, especially in, in, the, in the industry, the way it is today, right? There's not a lot of tolerance, right? For performance, for performance errors and issues, right? So one of the things is to cry, create a safe environment where people can fail and they can fail fast, right? Um, and they can, they can try new things. And part of that means empowerment. Um, so it's, I think it's getting harder for a lot of salespeople too, right? And a lot of sales leaders, just because there's a lot of sensitivity right now in the world, right? Whether it's regarding gender, race, religion, there's a lot of sensitivity. So it, it's, the margins for error are definitely becoming smaller and smaller, which is unfortunate because you learn so much more from losing than you do from winning, you know, and uh, I'm really, really grateful for all the losses that I've had because the losses have taught me more than the wins, you know, so um, sometimes the wins reinforce things and 
And it's like, it's like a crack in a foundation, right? Yeah. You don't see the crack, right? Yeah. And if you keep winning, you don't see the crack, but then eventually you get to a point and because you, because it never cracked before now, you don't even realize you've built everything on a really, really unstable foundation, right? So what, what area of win, what area of losses do you mean or mistakes do you want me to talk about? Um, okay. Let's, because you've got your own team and, and you speak to people daily, you lead a team, give me the first mistake that you made with people in a team and how that impacted you today. In at what point in my career, like this week or like when I first started? <laughs> Give me <laughs> whatever. I've like five this week, so. Oh, um, <laughs> so, but that's I mean that's, that's that's how you do it, right? Um, so one of the things I would say is critical. One of the biggest mistakes with people is not being clear on expectations, right? Um, that's one of the biggest ones, and not necessarily understanding why your ex not letting them understand why your expectations are your expectations. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and then the second thing around expectations is having too many expectations, right? You need to have, what are the right expectations? So if I'm, if, if I'm, you and I are working together and I say to you, all right, Annie, look, you got to do 10 of these interviews per week, right? Does it matter if you can do all 10 of them in two days? Mm -hmm. Does it matter? doesn't really matter. It shouldn't matter. But well, wait a second. I'm looking at it. Annie, you did all your interviews in three days. What'd you do with the other two days? Like there's nothing done here. Wait a second, Annie. Like, you gotta go, wait, 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 wait a second. You've got to do it. So now you're like, so what's the expectation? Was the expectation 10 interviews per week? Or was the expectation that you want to be to do two every single day? Yeah. Right. So what is it that you really and is your expectation that you want to be, you want to control what I'm doing or is your expectation just what the, what it, what you say it is so do you care how I do that so being really clear with that is is probably is is probably one of the biggest things and making sure that you understand when you set an expectation with somebody then then you have to allow them the freedom to be able to do it the second thing that I see that a lot of leaders don't do is drive and reinforce accountability, right? Accountability is taken, it's not given, right? So we take accountability. Yeah. And, um, and a lot of times leaders don't hold their people accountable the way that they should, right? Well, we talked about that. And the reason why they don't is because number one, it requires a tremendous amount of energy, right? Number two is that it requires a tremendous amount of discipline and number three is there's so much stuff, like we just talked about it, the things, so many things are changing all the time in our industry. It's really, really hard to get back on track, right? So it goes back to the expectations. If my expectations of you are one net new opportunity per week, and I'm looking at that on a rolling three week average, then every time that we talk, I need to make sure if that's really critical and that's the expectation, I need to be really, really clear on it. And then I need to make sure that I'm holding you accountable. Sometimes we try to be, hold people accountable for too much because we set the expectations too high. And then also too, our expectations keep changing. If you look at any software company, any small software company, what you'll see is you'll see um, when there's shift in product, right? And then the salespeople have to follow the shift in product it, it, it starts to unhook everything, right? Because they don't know what the expectation is. Yeah. Sometimes we have to allow expectations to burn in for a little while and focus on reinforcing it. You know, one of the things that I did is we hired a coach and his job, this guy was a professional, he's a professional coach. So he, 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 was, a, he was a military drill instructor. And what he does is he reinforces accountability. And, and he sits down. Last week, we talked about this. And how did we do against it? Okay, why didn't we do it? Why didn't we do it? What did we agree that we were going to do? Okay, so what are we going to do next week? And one of the most important things that he drives is really accountability. So I would say the two biggest things from a leadership perspective are expectations, setting the right expectations, following up on those expectations, but then holding them accountable, right? Those are probably the two biggest things that I would say that you're always going to work on with leaders because people, as we talked about, people are dynamic 
And not everybody is going to be the same. You're going to be very different than some one of my other leaders, right? Um, and that other leader is going to be different from a different leader. So the way that you manage to that is you have to manage by the individual, right? Because we're human and we change and we're and we're different. 